for you to continue to guide us and to direct us. We pray, Father God, that you give us the ability to hear your word and to apply it in our lives, Lord. We thank you again for another day of life, Lord. May you continue to lead us and direct us. It's in Jesus' precious name. And everyone said, Amen. Hey, let's uh, greet someone with a holy wave. We are in red tier, which is a good thing, but we still want to be cautious uh, with our church family. Uh, our children are going to be heading over to class. Uh, so the littles are going to be heading over and getting signed in. We do not have a nursery teacher, so our little littles will be staying in with mom and dad. So five and up are going to be heading over to uh, get their own teaching so they won't fall asleep in the big church. Well, good to see you guys this morning. Uh, we are going to continue our teaching in 1 John chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles, uh, let's turn to 1 John chapter 4. And I want to briefly share with the church body this morning that it, it has truly been a trying time. Uh, this past week. I'm not too sure if I'm the only one, but uh, there has been some pretty spiritual battles that have been going on um, this past week for myself and the family and, and uh, the church. Uh, we obviously have uh, one of ours, uh, uh, part of the worship team, who's at home recouping. Uh, she is under the weather as well as her hubby. So we want to keep... Uh, uh, Allison uh, in prayer, uh, as well as the hubby, uh, that way they can you know, get back here with the church body. I do have those announcements that uh, Pastor Wally talked about. This Wednesday, uh, we are going to resume midweek Bible studies. Um, and I'm excited, yes, I'm excited, uh, because... Uh, it's another opportunity to dive into God's Word um, with church body. And we'll be starting Wednesday at 6 p.m. Uh, because it does get kind of scary out there uh, for me uh, because there's no lights. You guys are used to it. You guys can probably do this, you know, like nothing. But I do want to start uh, at 6 and try to get out uh, by 7-ish, however the Lord leads. But a uh, great time in God's Word. And the way so you guys can know what midweek looks like and anticipate and to be in prayer for, whatever we discuss on Sunday, we're going to be uh, kind of taking bits of Scripture on Wednesday. And we're going to kind of deep uh, dig deeper in God's Word so we can grow together. So we're going to continue on hearing God's Word on Sunday. And then on Wednesday, we'll take a small chunk of that and really uh, take in God's Word so we can apply it effectively in our walks. And then we'll continue to go through that pattern as the Lord sees through these letters and then the next book in the near future. Was that all the announcements that we had? I'm trying to think. Yeah. Food ministry? Okay. So we have uh, goodies as usual that uh, needs to be eaten here on campus or you take with you back home. So we're back in John's letters and we might remember that Brother John took us from an outworking of his love for us. Chapter 3, verse 16, it reads really quick, By this we know love because he laid down his life for us and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren then closing out in verses 23 and 24 of chapter 3 it reads now he who keeps his commandments abides in him 
and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom he has given us. So we are abiding in him and him in us. Now continuing in chapter 4, we are going to hear a repeating theme or pattern that should be true in us. And by this, we should know we are true followers of Christ. And as I've, I, uh, I said before, if it's being repeated, it is worth paying attention to. So now let's just jump right into chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This one is huge. We, uh, we do not believe every spirit. This is a warning that John writes to us. Uh, we should never assume every spiritual experience or every demonstration of spiritual power is from God. We must test spiritual experiences and those spiritual phenomenons. And we have to see that if it lines up with God's word. And in fact, if it is from God. Or is it from man? So how do we do that? Do you dress up as spiritual uh, busters? Or sniffing out the truth over the lies? Is there a spiritual lie detector that we are to hang over people's heads? You know, remember John talked about how the Antichrist spirits are all around us. There are people, places, and things that do not want anything to do with Christianity. That do not want to accept the biblical truth because it reveals their ways are wrong. So not to get into the depths of cults or the different views on spiritual attributes, the bottom line that John is writing for us is pretty clear. When discussing truth, when testing the spirit of whatever it is that is trying to express its doctrine or ways of thinking, we are to say verse 2 and 3. Let's read together. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. By this you will know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus, Yeshua, which is our Savior, Christ, that is his title, not his last name, Mashiach, Messiah, has come in the flesh and is of God. So if it lines up to that or believes what the scripture says, it is of God. So Jesus is the Savior and the Messiah who came in the flesh. Now briefly, church, if people, places, and things are saying your Bible, the infallible, inspired Word of God is wrong, then we have a problem. If people, places, and things are using pamphlets, magazines to, to explain their version of truth, then we have a problem. Or if those people, places, and things are advertising for your financial help to change you, then we have a problem. What we teach isn't popular. What we preach is not accepted. But we do know the truth. And that truth is of Jesus Christ. And that truth will set you free. You know, this type of testing that John is sharing and the discernment 
is the responsibility of every Christian, especially us as leaders of the church body. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21, it reads, Test all things, hold fast what is good. Testing the spirits is the work of the body of Christ. Well, let me expound a little bit. Then when we'll move right on in the next verses. I have experienced and heard many stories of uh, leaders and, 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 and church members to be aware of uh, the wolf in sheep's clothing who basically would walk into uh, the front doors of the church house. And we're on guard to watch out for those individuals. But... As with ministry, we come to learn that the church folks are where our problems lie. Some of the church folks want the popular teachings, the popular things. They want uh, to undermine the teachings of uh, the leadership or change the vision that God has for the church. And those are the things that we also need to be watchful for those are the same same spirits of that antichrist that john is talking about and that's why it's so important that we are in prayer that we are in his word to know how to handle those situations especially especially as a body of christ we are to learn and grow together in god's word verse 4 you are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. It might be discouraging. It might be frustrating. And it might be even heartbreaking. But nevertheless, he who is in you is greater. Verse 5 and 6. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. You know, John gives us the second test of true teachers who speak God's word and follow this doctrine, period. There is no denying the truth that the world speaks and hears what they want, and even to the extreme of believing errors and lies to justify their sinful nature. You know, I really don't want to get into the depths, but I, I came across this little headline and you guys can go home and do some research, but truly pray about it before you do. This is a, a little caption that I, I read and I wanted to share with you guys. Those who worked so hard to cancel Mr. Potato Head, Dr. Seuss, and Pepe Le Pew, you have done it so quickly and successfully. Will you please direct your efforts towards canceling child pornography, pedophilia, and sex trafficking. Clearly, somehow, your voices are heard over the rest of us, and we would like to help with these three issues, which don't seem to be at the top of your list of priorities, but are for the rest of us. We would like to know your secrets and how you make these cancellations happen so fast. So we can make real changes that improve social, economical, and humanitarian issues. Verse 5, they are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. This is the day and age that we are living in church. While it looks like everything is out of control, though, behind the scenes there is a God who has not surrendered his authority. Martin Lloyd-Jones. 
Mice die in mouse traps because they do not understand why the cheese is free. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. The believer has a resource for victory. Jesus, which makes victory always possible. And if you, again, will rely on he who is in you instead of relying on ourselves, then we won't rely on the other things trying to distract us from that victory. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. This means the Christian has no place for fear. We have many spiritual enemies but not one of them is greater than Jesus who lives in us. Verses 7 through 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. We are not commanded to love one another, to earn or become worthy of God's love. We love one another because we are loved by God and have received that love and live in the light of that. Again, John insists here that there is something that is given to the believer when they are born of God, a love that is revealed in their lives, in our lives that we never had before. There is a transformation, there is a change that happens and takes place in our lives when Jesus is entered in, when we accept Christ. And God knows that there are several different words in, you know, like, for example, the ancient Greek language. And that's why we shared last time talking about the word know, gnosko, is the knowledge, the understanding by his experiences that take place in each and every one of you. John is saying when we really experience God, it will show by our love for one another. Early on in the ministry, I knew that the Lord was calling me and I shared with the Lord, you know, just continue to guide me. Give me that love. Give me that desire. Give me that vision. And there was three scriptures, three images and illustrations of uh, me being a leader of a church or a part of that type of leadership. And the first image was having the love of God. And I said, okay, well, that's going to take a lot because that's something that I do genuinely struggle with. Sharing the love of God 24-7. Then the next image is uh, the, the scene where Jesus meets the woman at the well. And here Jesus is tired and weary and he, he just sits there for a second and he asks for water from someone who he shouldn't be talking to. One, he's a rabbi, and he's talking to a Samaritan, totally off limits, and she's a woman. You don't do those things. But yet, Jesus had an appointment to divinely meet this woman at the well. And I said, that's the type of church, that's the type of leadership, Lord, that I want to be a part of, that you will have to show me and guide me to show love, and to meet people right where they are. The third one we'll get to, I'm sure, in the months ahead. Of course, this love is not perfected in the life of a Christian as we walk this earth. Though it is not perfected, it must be practiced. And it should be growing you can't truly grow in your experience of God without also growing for the love of one another. John can boldly say, he who does not love does not know God. 
if there isn't real love for God's people in your life, then God is truly not over your life. And it's difficult for us to hear this, but John, again, he just brings it straight to the point. If you don't love one another, then you do not love God. Love is of God. The love John speaks of comes from the ancient Greek word agape. It is the concept of a self-giving love that gives without demanding or expecting repayment. This is the sacrificial love that is demonstrated in the Lord Jesus Christ. Since this is uh, God's kind of love, it comes into our life through our relationship with Him. If we want to love one another more, we need to draw closer to God. Every human relationship is like a triangle. So picture this triangle, okay? And at the top of the triangle, there's God. So here's man and here's the woman. And as they are growing in their relationship together in the Lord, they're seeking the Lord first and foremost. And as they are continuing to grow, what is happening to him and her? They're getting closer. That is the image. That is the love that should be taking place in our lives. As we get closer and draw to the Lord, we get closer to one another. Weak relationships are made strong when both people draw close to the Lord. Everyone who loves is born of God. He who does not love does not know God. This does not mean that every display of love in the world can only come from a Christian. Those who are not Christians still can display acts of love. However, true sacrificial love does originate from Jesus Christ, who died for you and me. And that is why God is love. This is a glorious truth. Love describes the character and heart of God. He is so rich in love and compassion that it can be used to describe Him so simply. Never let it be thought that any sinner is beyond the reach of divine mercy so long as he is in the land of the living. I stand here to preach illimitable love, unbounded grace to the vilest of the vile, to those who have nothing in them, that can deserve consideration from God. Man who ought to be swept into the bottomless pit at once if justice meted out to them in the deserts. Spurgeon writes. The Bible also tells us that God is spirit, God is light, and that God is a consuming fire, and God is love. God is spirit, God is light, and God is a consuming fire, and God is love. We are to abide in Him as He abides in us. We need to appreciate this fully and receive the fatherly love God has to give us. And some of us, for whatever reason, have come to think of God the Father as you know, aloof or a mean a uh, mean man, perhaps of uh, the, the Old Testament descriptions. Man, God's so angry, and he's, he's got uh, a wrath. But again, that's the lack of gnosko, the knowledge. But the Father loves us. And I share, too, uh, many times, Father, our Father in heaven, is just like a father here on earth. If your kids are doing something wrong, we need to correct. And when that correction uh, is obviously um, uh, given the type of consequences of a spanking, well, that doesn't mean that that father doesn't love you. 
That means that Father does love you. And so a lot of people interpret the Old Testament as this God who's so mean. But in the New Testament times, it's no different. We have a Father, and He loves us. And He doesn't want to see anyone perish. He doesn't want you guys to go off on the wrong path. And so He's constantly getting our attention. And sometimes there is spanking involved. But it's a good thing. We also know that we can receive the healing power in our Father's love. It is opening day for a T-baller across the city. And these two brothers rush to sign up uh, to the T-ball the table. And uh, the person that's taking in uh, the information tells the first kid, What's your name, kid? Oh, he shares his name. Oh, he's so excited. Man, are you excited to play ball? Yeah, I've, we've been waiting all season. And so well, we're here to sign up. Cool. So what's your name? Got it. Oh, how old are you? Got it. Perfect. All right. Who is this? Oh, this is my brother. Oh, what's your name? Oh, super cool. You're excited? Yeah, both of you guys are going to play on? Yeah. All right. Got your name down. How old are you? Oh, the same age. The same age? Wait a minute. When were you born? Oh, I was born uh, uh, this, this month, and then my brother was born this month, three months apart. So the guy's questioning, well, wait a minute, how is that possible? One of the little kids you know, shares, well, one of us is adopted. One of you are adopted? Yeah. So the guy goes on, well, who's adopted? Um, we don't know. Our dad says that, you know, it's been so long, we, we were babies, and he don't remember which one is adopted. The father arrives and is asked, which one is adopted? And he responds, I truly don't remember. And to be honest, it really doesn't matter. Because these are my boys. I love them equally. That is a type of love that our Heavenly Father has for us, for you, and for me. Romans 8, 15. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own child. And now we call him Abba, Father. Verse 9 through 11. In this the love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. And this is, the, is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation that is a sacrifice or gift for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. You know, Jesus is the only begotten Son, meaning His Sonship is different than ours. He was and is of the same essential nature and being as God the Father. We are human beings. He is a God being who added humanity to his deity. That we might live through him, the Father, the love of the Father, was not only in sending of the Son, but also in what that sending accomplishes for us. It brings life to all who trust in Jesus and his work on their behalf. Because he is the propitiation. That's the sacrifice, the gift offering for our sins that we might live through him. The greatness of God's love is shown not only in saving us from the judgment we deserved, but also in wanting us to live through him. Do we live through him this morning? Are we received as his son and daughter? Are we a part of his family? 
Are we loving one another as the Lord wants us to love? This is a great way to define our Christian life, our attitude, our actions, and our affections. If God had just sent Jesus to teach us about himself, that would have been wonderful enough. If it would have been far more than we deserved. If God had sent just Jesus uh, simply to just be that example, that would have been good too. But the wonderful thing is that God did not stop with these, but rather sent his son, not merely to teach or to be our example, but to die the death of a felon, that he might save us from sin. Commentary Boyce. And this is love, real love, agape love. It's not defined by our love for God. It is not defined by our love for God, but by his love for us. His love for us initiates our relationship, like I said earlier. We are to want to love Him because He first loved us. I know it, sometimes it does get very frustrating and sometimes it seems impossible to love the way the Lord loves, especially when you know, we're dealing with issues but I do want to share again the importance of being in this word. Staying grounded with his word will give us the strength and give us the ability to continue on doing the things that he wants us to do. When we hear uh, those things, or, oh, I love God, many would say, but do they say it with a true meaning? Is that the same love you have for cheesecake and coffee and your favorite sports team? Eros? The love of the flesh or the lust of desires? Or is it the phileo love? The Philadelphia brotherly love? Camaraderie? Having a common bond love? Or is it true agape? Sacrificial love? putting oneself to the side or placing one's life for another, expecting nothing in return. That is agape love. That's the type of love the Lord wants us to have. Our love for God, again, doesn't really say anything great about us. In fact, it's amazing how God loves you. Oh, God loves me. That is what is amazing. Even as I studied this and prayed about this, and I'm standing up here preaching about this, like I shared, I fail. I fall short displaying that type of love to my wife, to my kids, and those the Lord puts in my path at times. He is using flawed people. I get it. I see it. But we are to seek repentance and seek the Lord's words to help apply in our lives, to be guided and directed, to be better men and women of the Lord. No coincidence, chance, or luck in this next scripture that is going to be shared. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. Love, again, never loses faith. It always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. Verse 13, three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of this is love. 
Here is the, that good news. Verses 15 through 16. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Jesus is the Son of God. God abides in him and he in God. It isn't enough to know the facts about Jesus, who Jesus is. We must confess the truth. The idea behind the word confess is to be in agreement with. We learn that. We must agree with God about who Jesus is. And we find out what God says about Jesus through the word of God. Though John has been writing much about love, he does not ignore the issues of the truth. That we are imperfect. We are going to fail. And there is going to be things in our lives that we need to test and we need to confess and we need to get rid of. But Jesus is the Son of God. And we are to love one another. This is the Christian's proper response to who God is and how he loves us. We are called to take the love and grace God gives to know it by experience and to believe it. This is what fellowship, partnership with God is all about, which is the truth. God doesn't just love all of us. He loves each of us. To feel God's love is very precious, but to believe it when you don't feel it, it is the noblest, Spurgeon says. In closing, church, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 23-24, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. God is more pleased when you get right with your brother or sister than if you bring him a sacrifice of praise or resources. We all fall short. But let us reflect on those imperfections to be more like Christ. We are adopted sons and daughters, and he loves us so, so much. If there is anyone out there who doesn't feel as a son or a daughter, maybe you can't forgive those who have hurt you or want to even have a relationship with God because there's too many imperfections in your lives. We know where that comes from. We know the history and the, the damage that has uh, caused your life to think that way and to feel that way. But greater is he that is in you. That's what we read. Those things of the past are of the past. Those things that have caused the damage, God can bring the healing, the restoration, the peace, the joy, and the love. But you have to allow Christ into your lives. If you do feel led to seek prayer, we do have elders. Seek out your elders. Pull someone who is a seasoned uh, man uh, in the Lord to the side and say, can you pray with me? Or that sister who maybe the Lord is drawing you because that's the sister who you see as a seasoned Christian, woman, godly. May you pull her to the side. Say, hey, pray for me, sister. But I do want to pray for you now. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this opportunity to be used to share your word. We pray, Father God, that you continue to guide us and direct us in our every step. 
I pray for my brothers and sisters who are here present and those who will be watching. I pray that you continue to impact their hearts, minds, and souls. I pray that they accept you into their lives, that they will call you Abba, Father, that they will be received as that son and that daughter, a part of this family who knows without a shadow of a doubt that they are loved. I thank you again. Lord, may you continue to guide them and direct them. In Jesus' name, amen. Ephesians 4, 31, 32, and I'm wrapping this up. It's the NLT version. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, of be, instead be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. There was a college drama teacher who had a very small budget and only could afford three scripts of this upcoming drama for the school. And so what he did was he got the three scripts and he uh, broke uh, up the scripts and made copies and he gave them to each of his class. And so he assigned his students uh, uh, a part of the play, part of uh, the drama that's going to be taking place. And so they went home and they learned their part, word for word. And then they came back weeks later, and he had all of his classroom, and he said, okay, start with your part. Okay, start with your part, and start with your part. And so they're repeating their part, their script that they had studied. And it was mumbled and jumbled, and nobody really could understand where this drama or how it was taking place. He says, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. He got the script out. And he read it from page one, page two, page three. Read it all the way through. One student at the end says, Oh, now I get it. I can see it. Because he put all those scripts and all the parts together. And he read it out loud. And that is my prayer as we journey through these letters. Verse by verse. And we're seeing the picture and this image that Brother John is sharing with us. And I pray, church, that you begin to see what God is putting together for us. Amen? Are we closing in worship? Yes? All right. Worship team, can you come back up here? And we are going to close out in worship. And as usual, God bless you guys. We'll see you, whoever is going to be here this Wednesday. I will be here this Wednesday. And looking forward to a new week to use these scriptures. Amen. God bless you guys. See you outside.